Um, how do you determine whether a feature um, is available? The way I would do that is I would um, often in the Python docs, when you look it up, they will actually tell you what version something was added. So um, this is not the example you talked about, but let's see, like, for example, let's see if I can find where it says. Yeah, here's a good. Okay, so exceptions, for example, have a method called exception objects have a method called add note. So this allows you to do something like catch an exception, add some information that's a locally available to it and re-raise the exception so that whatever has, whatever handles it higher up can um, be informed by that, okay? Or if there's a stack trace because nothing catches it, then you have this additional information that was available closer to the source of the exception that helps you decipher the stack trace and identify the bug and more quickly fix it, okay? So this is, um, and so this was added in 3.11, okay? So you look up the feature and it's actually added, it, often if it's something was added within the past few years, which is to say the past few major releases, because the 3.x, you know, the the dot x numbers increment once per year now. Uh, and so that will be um, added, that will be indicated there, okay? So you can go, now that's one way to do it. Now, another way to do it is to, if you say, well, this is, so that's where you have, that helps you figure out the question, the answer to the question. Here's a feature of Python, I want to know which version of Python added that, okay? That's how you answer that question. Now, let's say you go the other direction. I say, you say, okay, I have, I'm working with this specific feature of Python, oh, excuse me, I'm working this specific version of Python, and I want to know if this version has this feature, okay? So first of all, I would go to the most recent release, okay, which is what you get by default, when you go into docs.python.org, and I would find the documentation for the version or for the feature. And let's say it does not have that kind of annotation. Okay. Uh, it may not say because it doesn't, the farther back you go, the less likely it is that it will tell you. Uh, they do have some things that go pretty far back but it's not necessarily comprehensive for versions of Python that are many years old, okay? Or not many, but even several. What you can do then is you go to the top, you can just in the drop down, go to the version. Let's say you're on a, um, you know, a surprising, believe it or not, there's a lot of companies that are still using 3.8, okay? So you can just go to that version, the drop down, and check and see if it was actually in there like add note. See, I'm searching using the browser search and I'm not finding it in the documentation. So if you can find it, um, so, you know, that that's how you go in the other direction. Like say, this version of Python doesn't have this feature. Well, go look for its documentation and in this drop down, you choose the, um, you know, the version and see if the documentation's there. And if you can't find it, you know, it helped if you check in the most recent version of Python's documentation so you know where it is in the documentation and just then go and check and see if it's in the same place in the older older version. If not, it was not in there. That's the general methodology. Does that answer the question for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mainly ask because in, in, sometimes you have to deal with um, air gap environments. Mm. And in those environments, as you know, it's just, uh, you know, they get outdated very easily. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you can just, like, app update or something. Yeah. 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 And uh, and then from there, you have to uh, guess, yeah, figure out how to work with the person yeah. that, that that's actually on those environments. I mean, you know, and um, you probably know this, but just for completeness, I'll point out that you can...
you know, they if you have a Python, you can just check its exact version with dash capital V mm -hmm. or Python three is what I have available here, or double dash version. You probably you may know maybe you knew that Lewis. I'm just saying for anybody who's watching the recording, uh, in case they didn't know. Um, so that is how you tell what version of Python you have in that um, possibly air gapped environment. Uh, you were asking about a specific feature. It sounds like about merging dictionaries. Yeah, yeah, I, I had to do that yeah. earlier. And um, let's see. And, uh, I know we can that. figure out when that was added. Um, I'm I'm want to make sure I understand. So if you have, well, okay, so I have you know x one equals um, a seven b three c z. Let's say. 22 okay and so x um update uh, x um so let's say x2 let's call it something like that i i put it on the chat oh let me look it's pretty much merging json together yeah um, yeah okay i get you get you at, yeah. the, at the end of the day uh dictionary a dictionary b those are pretty much files of JSON and, and mm -hmm. uh, gotcha. you know, okay. and just merge them together like that to get the final data. Okay, let's say, so then you have X1, X2. I'm just yeah. gonna run this on the command line to. Okay. Yeah, and that merges them together. Right. So, yeah. So, this is the syntax where we have the basically argument unpacking. It works by the same mechanism as KW args. So, your question is, when was this added, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it, was, it was three. It was 3.8, I think. Um, yeah. But I know that they're <laughs> probably going to... Well, let's see how... This one's a little bit trickier because it's um, like locating it in the documentation is yeah it's not it's not like a function that you can look up it's like a syntax thing um it might be in the language reference so you go to docs.python.org it has a top level it has the tutorial which actually some information that even experienced python developers need to look up sometimes is actually in the tutorial believe it or not so it's not like you'll get to a point where you never, ever use a tutorial, tutorial. Once in a while, I will need to look up something in the tutorial because that's the easiest way to access documentation about it. But um, there's library reference for the built-in, the standard library. I use that more than any other section of the docs. It, but I think what we're looking for here for the dictionary merging syntax, I think that's likely to be in the language reference. So... Let's see here. Where would that be? See, the thing about the language reference is sometimes it's a little hard to just look at the search or in the page of the table of contents and find what you want. Um, let, me just let me look here. Well, I'll tell you a trick I use. If I want to find information about dictionary or a built-in type, there's kind of a hack I'll use to find where it is in the documentation here. Mm -hmm. I'll go to the library reference, and then I'll go to the second item that says built-in functions. You see that? Yeah. And that brings up this table. Now, they are loose with what they count as a quote-unquote function, and this looseness is useful to us because we have dict in here. It's really, they really should you know the proper name for this would be built-in callables but nobody would know what that means unless they're relatively advanced in python so they call it functions so it's correct that they chose to call this built-in functions but it's really built-in callables and so dict is not a function it's a type it's a class that's built in but it's callable so it's listed here okay and then it says create a new dictionary the dict object is the dictionary class okay so we follow this lead. So we have some links here. We have this one, which goes to the standard types section, which is actually um, here. And so 
Um, so we have mapping. Let's see. There it is. This is the section, right? But I, I, I find it's quicker often if I want to look up something about dictionaries. I could dig down to where it says mapping types dict here. But, um, and probably some people prefer to do it that way, but I typically, maybe just out of habit, I just go to built-in functions and then look up the not a function called dict here, click on that. And then it has basically any information I might need is in one of these links up here. So are these all the same link? No. This and this are the same, and this is a different one. But let's look at this one, because <clears throat> probably that's what we want. Um... Let's see. No, I messed up. Um, oh, so they tell you syntactically. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. It, the documentation that Python has is really, really, really good. So I have to work hard to write a book that improves on it. Let's see, dictionary view objects is not what we want, but I'm just looking to see kind of now this path. Hmm. Why is it this? Not seeing anything here explicitly about that syntax. Might not be documented in this section, or it's possible it's not. Possible it's only documented in some PEP somewhere, a Python enhancement proposal document somewhere. But let's see. Oh, that's, yeah. That's, and we were just at. Okay, so it's not there. Let me see if I can spot something in here. I'm always a weird one. Um, it's unusual. Yeah, it is a weird one. <laughs> yeah. I w yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep trying to find. And we can definitely take it offline, you know, to... No, no, we're going to find it now if we're going to find it at all. Uh, so, you know, it helps to know the name of the feature, like argument unpacking is the way yeah. I, general name, but it might have a different name in this context. Um, it's unpacking in one thing, but the thing is that we, we're unpacking two dictionaries and, and then forming a new one, pretty much. Yeah. That might be a syntactic update that might be, you know, I wonder, I mean, I wonder if that's a more general phenomenon about argument unpacking. Let me see. I would not be surprised if it is. Um, yeah, I think I read maybe in Stack Overflow that it was uh, 38. Um, but I just want to know, like, okay, for real, like, this belongs to that version or what version? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, I understand. Let's try. Especially on, on the 10-digit version, 10x, 2x versions, like 310, 311, 311, uh -huh. um, above 9. So, yeah, it's not specific to dictionaries, actually. Okay, so uh, that's what this little program demonstrates. So what happens is the way argument unpacking works for um, keyword for for mapping types, meaning the the star star what it, thing, um, that actually works even here with a function call, right? You see, like I call it here and it prints out, you know, A B Z C Q, right? A B Z C. -Q. Sorry, are you sharing or? Oh, I'm not sharing. Excuse me. I wrote this night program. Okay. Yeah. So here's, let me, okay. So you guys didn't see me write this program or run it. So I wrote this function 
uh, called print quarks that just takes star star quarks and it's quarks as a dictionary. So it iterates through the key value pairs and prints that out. And I put a couple of dictionaries in there, in here. I just copy pasted from the previous program. And then I run it and notice the way I'm invoking this print quarks function. I say star star x1, star star x2. See, it, basically using the same syntax that we used to create the dictionary in the previous program, right? Um, so now I run it and look at the output, right? A, B, Z, C, Q. A, B, Z, C, Q, right? So what this tells us is that this is not specific to dictionaries at all. It's actually a syntactic um, extension to the argument unpacking syntax in every context in which you might use that. So if we look at the documentation again, if I go to here, let me rearrange things. Okay, so we go to Yeah, so we go to this again. Notice that this first line here, so um, this line that's highlighted where it says dict parentheses star star quarks, or if we say, you know, curly brackets with uh, that's equivalent, then basically this here is um, whenever you have star star quarks, you can do this kind of thing where you unpack multiple dictionaries in sequence and it will unpack the first dictionary first a b z z and then unpack the second dictionary c q so um that tells us that if it's in the documentation it will not be under dict because it has it's not specific to dict at all anywhere that you can use argument unpacking will be relevant so Informed by that realization, let me look back to the language reference. I wonder if this is one of those things that's actually in the tutorial. It's kind of hard to search for this. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, because it's mm -hmm. a wild card, right? <laughs> wild card, my plus plus wild, wild card. And... Yeah. Let's see if I search for pep argument. Okay. Look at that. It's probably. I bet you it's in this pep four forty eight, but that was actually three five, so maybe not. Um, no, no, actually it is. Yeah, I right can... here. Yeah, so I'd use yeah. that. So yeah, I mean sometimes it's just the easy, quickest way to find out is just to write a little test program that exercises a feature and see if it actually works. You know, on that yeah. Python. Yeah. Sometimes it's the most expedient way to find out. And, and and I mm -hmm. guess we can if you're not sure on the, on the syntax, we can throw in there some try blocks. Um, well, well, I mean, I would prefer to you know 
identify what the thing does, uh, what the the Python version that I'm using actually supports, because um, you know you're going to be. Or is it the kind of thing where you can develop and test it with that Python version before you deploy it? Yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah, something yeah. that. Which is a normal situation, right? Usually, you don't have to write Python on one machine and then you deploy it to an alien environment with a different version of Python, and you just have to you have to make it work, even though you can't test it in that context. That's not normal. <laughs> not normally the constraint you have to work under, right? So, um, yeah, I would not even do the try accept thing. I would actually just identify clearly whether that Python version supports that feature or not, and that mm -hmm. way. Because when you have a try except block that you know tries to fall back, you're making your code more complex, and you're create you're creating a larger surface area from which bugs can originate. Right? You know, like in security, we have this concept of called the attack surface. Are you familiar with this idea, Lewis? Uh no. Okay. Well, in security, we have the, there's a concept called the attack surface, and that means the system that you're hardening against hackers, we say, what are the, what, what does this system have that may be possible ways they could get into or exploit bugs to get access to the system and escalated privileges or whatever it is? And can we make that, can we remove things from this system such that there are fewer potential avenues for a hacker to attack okay so that can be like you know on a web server you want to uninstall software that you do not need for that particular web ser web server and the applications running on it because if you have something like some kind of ser uh, service that is let's say like redis for example and well if you are using redis um then you which you know is like kind of a, a that if you're using that kind of service, um, then you need to have it on the machine. But if you do not need it, then maybe remove it because then it won't be listening to, there's no way it can be listening onto some external port. And maybe there's a CVE, what, you know, some, uh, someone announces, hey, we found this security vulnerability in Redis that would allow a outside attacker to gain access to the system through Redis. Well, if you just remove Redis from the system, they cannot exploit that vector, right, to get in, right? It's not so you reduce the vulnerability there. Um, so that's what we mean by reducing the attack surface. You're reducing the number of possible ways that a hacker might be able to attack that software system, okay? By analogy, there's something that doesn't really have a name like attack surface does in security, but whenever we are writing a program, we can think of like a bug surface of how can we structure our code so that there is less opportunity for bugs to slip by, right? And so that's why I would not do the try accept thing. I would just really go straight to identify, does it support this feature I want or not? Get a clear answer on that. And then once you have that clear answer, then you either code it to use that feature or you don't. And that's the way I would approach it. 